money in the bag. You see them lames grinning, you see them graves digging. Stay focused on them streets, my nigga, I pay attention. I keep the law as I should, the Torah and the Talmud. The saint don't believe in taint, so your pain's understood. We converse dollars over earth, keep the grain on the wood. Keep our women bisexual looking, got this level good. That's class with a dash of some hood. The ingredients of businessmen and never know what with you see me in the invisible greedy gin with this sleazy grin, easy trigger hairpin. I let the games be getting a judge like a referee and never let my grudges get the best of me. This the recipe of the nigga chef for your G. For success, I protest to never be employee. Nigga, I don't believe in trust. This yoga type. He got to come to the round table. That's right. With the God and Shetty. Right. Black pop. Right, that's what I'm saying. Hey man, we got a I got a presentation coming up. We ain't got the date set because we round tabling that's over right. here. We, we going, we going yeah. Out the yeah. Okay, right. go ahead. Oh, uh, you know, this kicked out of heaven, you know, the untold history of the uh, white races from seven hundred to seventeen hundred. Yeah. A D. We're gonna go Boy, going in on your master, <laughs> going in on your on your granddad, yeah, on master other land. Yeah. <laughs> going in on master once again. You know? Nah, nah. When I saw that meme, you remember that meme when they shot when they blew up Britain, and I saw that meme when oh, they yeah. said, "Lord, they." They done blew up the other land. <laughs> That's what this shit is right here. This is about the other land. Okay, this is <laughs> this is Europe right here. You dig what I'm saying? We ain't got the date set, man. You know, this is a little short video. We over here, early bird doing it. That's you know, right. Get ready. yeah. Getting ready to get big. Yeah. But most definitely, we gonna uh, get together and. Uh, this is right up my alley. Yeah. And I really want to uh, get down to some of the major uh, topics of the book. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So get back with me. Yeah, know? yeah. He going to do the questionnaire. And see what's happening here is I'm gifting. This is when you do, when you're doing business, That's you right. got a gift. That's right. And I gift niggas who didn't put in the work. And he didn't put in the work with many documentaries flying all across the globe doing his lecturing. So this is gifting for men who put in work. This is for those who know me. You know what I'm saying? Ooh, I gift niggas. Right my you know what I'm saying? And there's a lot more coming, man. Especially for those who gonna help me out with the music and all of that. And the guy 720 all on Amazon. Keenan Booker all on Amazon. You can, you can, uh, you know, put both names in the search engine and different products to pull up. That's you right. dig what I'm saying? So, right. yeah, we, we making this real early. This ain't number two, three minutes, man. Let y'all niggas know how we do in Vegas, man. Early bird, get the worm. That's right. Yeah, so. Bangonthebeast.com. Yeah, bangonthebeast.com. He got the, tell him about the come ups you got this, this is already in stone, man. Oh, man, uh, um, July the 9th, I'm gonna be in Dallas, you know, uh, Pan African Connection. Uh, brother Ro uh, Robert uh, West down there. Uh, I, I might even fuck his name. <laughs> <laughs> so we just you know July 9th you gonna be where yeah, yeah. in Dallas okay y'all look out and y'all y'all put some y'all go check it out with, and see what's, what's going down man what you gonna be talking about oh man uh the revolutionary history of ancient Kim oh okay that's right and that's all the yeah warriors. Yeah, the warriors and the conflicts. That's right. Right, right. So, you know, that's how we, that's what we're going to be talking about, man. Y'all check out TheGod720.com. Y'all check out Kicked Out of Heaven, Black Man's Bible. We doing it, all right?
my nigga. He's the son of the original G. Jesus. Okay, so here we go. We kicked out of heaven. Volume three, the saints. There's many different subjects in this uh, volume that I could have went over. I believe the saints were very important as we will be going over more saints in the holiday lecture, which is the second disc to this uh, volume. I believe it was important to go over the saints because nobody knows about the saints. But you are involved with saints and you deal with saints every single day. You just didn't know it. We have cities like St. Louis. You have uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. There's, there's probably a saint city in every state of America, I'm pretty sure. Um, because it's a mathematical system. It's a very complex system. You gotta go through a lot of information to understand uh, what is really going on in the uh, the realm of the saints okay you gotta go through a lot of info um, to, under to understand this so let's go on in the beginning here we're gonna go through um, we're gonna go through the functions of the church okay the definitions, we're just going to go through the definitions of a lot of words that may have been ran across you in uh, movies that you didn't know, that you didn't hear the word because you didn't know what the word was and you didn't know the definition. So, the Catechism. The Ecclesiastical Definition is an elementary book containing a summary of the principles of the Christian religion, especially as maintained by a particular church in the form of questions and answers. The contents of such a book a similar book of instruction in other subjects. A series of formal questions put to political candidates to bring out their views. Uh, a catechetical instruction. Okay. Now, the important thing right here is when they say, especially as maintained by a particular church. So, there's many different orders, many different churches, many different functions inside the Catholic Church and they all have different catechisms okay pertaining to what their uh, system is now the beatification is a recognition accorded by a Catholic Church of a dead person's entrance into heaven and capacity to intercede on behalf of individuals who pray in his or her name the beatification is the act of beatifying a state of being beatified uh, the official act of the Pope whereby a deceased person is declared to be enjoying the happiness of heaven and therefore a proper subject of religious honor and public cult in certain uh, places now what this is is a definition applied now you have to understand that words are catacombs and um with the words being catacombs, we have to understand that, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, in the catacombs of all of Europe, as they stretch about 700 to 900 miles in the tunnels underneath the ground, there's over 6 million to 7 million different bones of human beings that compile what we call a catacomb. This is also, these, as a matter of fact, these avenues in the catacombs is where the word street comes from. So, a street in the catacomb was the hallway in which you walked where you saw all the bones. And there's different prayer rooms in the catacombs and other things that was going on. Now, you have to understand that this is a metaphysic. The beatification is a metaphysic for angel position. Let's read it again. Is a recognition accorded by the Catholic Church of a dead person's entrance into heaven and capacity to intercede on behalf of individuals who pray in his or her name. 
So, what that's stating is, is that the saints embody a position that is a metaphysical union in between the angelic realms and the human existence. So, in order for that to occur, they have to represent a multitude of different principalities that are in the human communication structure. Okay? And this also deals with uh, the recognition of all the elements that the human has to deal with. Okay? They are embodied inside the different saints. There are over 4,000 different saints. Every, every day of the week has at least about uh, 10 to 20 saints that are that have their feast day on that day and that's every day of the calendar so then that means there are saints that are already associated with you pertaining to your birthday now how what is the what is the what is the mechanism as i stated earlier these saints have to represent the different elements so what happens is that every day of the year has a different energy the saints of the day are the system of the energy of that day. So the 20 saints are describing all the energies and the possibilities of that one single day. Okay, so let's keep going. Now a schism, okay, is a division between people usually belonging to an organization, movement, or religious denomination. The word is most uh, frequently applied to a split in what uh, had previously been a single religious body such as the East-West Schism or the Great Western Schism. It is also used of a split within a non-religious organization or movement or more broadly of a separation between two or more people be it brothers, friends, lovers, etc. Uh, the Schism. Now, okay, it's kind of funny because in the Pimpin language they say the ism and this is the Schism. The, the, the great divider is what's happening here. Okay? So, the schism is the dividing mechanism and is done in between organizations uh, first and foremost. And it was definitely done religiously by uh, the debates, the multitude of different debates that happen over time uh, designing the religion. Okay? And different philosophies that were supposed to be embedded into the religious structures that we today are confused with. Okay, now, the canonization is the act by which the Catholic Church or the Anglican Communion declare that a person who has died was a saint upon which declaration the person is included in the canon or list of recognized saints. Originally, persons were recognized as saints without any formal process. Later, different processes were developed such as those used today in the Eastern Orthodox Church and Roman Catholic Church. Now they got the Eastern Orthodox, Western Orthodox, and all the unorthodox and all this other stuff. I didn't get in, into the details of all of that. I didn't really feel it was necessary. Because when you get at the root, you have the, the seed is the seed. It divides later once it gets out the dirt. So I go for the seed, and that's what we have here. The canonization is the process of uh, claiming one is a saint. Now you have to understand that uh, to be a saint, you have to have lived through uh, the passion, okay? And that's really what it is. And there's different types of saints. There's martyr saints, there's virgin saints, there's virgin martyr saints, okay? You have the children saints, okay? And really, I've never really seen a title of a group called the children saints, but I'm stating that now because there are saints that are children Okay, who were, uh, who usually were murdered. Okay, the majority of saints, from my recollection, are martyrs. Okay, and they died in way outlandish ways, and that's why a lot of people don't know too much about the Roman history. Because the Roman history is really a history of the Roman emperors battling and destroy and killing Christians everywhere. Okay, so the veneration. Or veneration of saints is the act of honoring a saint, a person who has been identified as having a high degree of sanctity or holiness, as I stated the passions. Okay, and, and we're going to talk about that sanctity and that holiness here in a second. Angels are shown similar veneration in many uh, religions. Philologically, to venerate derives from the Latin verb venerare. Uh, 
meaning to regard with reverence and respect. Veneration of saints is practiced formally or informally by adherents of some branches of all major religions, including Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism. Okay? Now, I have seen, I have found, now that's what it states. Now, me personally, I've only found a lot of this activity inside the Judaism and the Islam, and of course it's going to be there in the Hinduism. Okay, but uh, Christianity, of course, but, uh, you know, Christianity is dull of what the real Christianity is, the, the Christianity of today. Okay, now, religious ecstasy is a type of altered state of consciousness characterized by greatly reduced external uh, awareness and expanded interior mental and spiritual awareness, frequently accompanied by visions and emotional and sometimes Physical euphoria. The euphoria. We're getting high, people. We want to be high. And that is the human's that's the human's definition of in existence. Um you know. Um the human's definition in existence is to get high. Okay? And, you know, another, another point of your existence is you're going to have to beg and everything. You will have, you will have to use sympathy. You will manipulate. You will, you will inflict pain. You will feel pain. This is what you will do in this paradigm. Okay? It is every human's mission on planet Earth to make every other human believe you're bullshit. That's what it is. And that's why we are here today. Because I'm tired of the dumb shit. Now, let's go in. Now, oh, let me state that about that religious ecstasy. As we see the word ecstasy, ecstasy, dope. We know the drug, ecstasy. So, the religious ecstasy, which is what we will be seeing later on here, you know, really deals with a lot of things like levitating and, you know, breathing fire and, uh, you know, uh, making dogs come back to life. You know, as a matter of fact, um, the saint who um, made the dog come back to life is Saint Martin de Porres. And he is a mulatto. He is the mulatto saint. And this could be uh, some metaphysic behind the whole, you know, why the Mike Vick situation happened like it happened. Because the touching of the zone of the sympathy towards the dog and towards the black male that was running around and doing good in the football. It was so, it was basically a large betrayal that could have affected their psyche due to the fact on the Catholicism that's loaded in the blood and they may not have this known consciously. One thing you must understand is that the system of ether is a is a is not Catholic, but they have made, they have embodied the laws of the ethereal inside the Catholic system. Okay, is that that's what you must understand. Okay, and I know a lot of people are going to like what I'm stating. Okay, as I will also state this before we go in a little bit further. As I will also state this. Well, no, I'm 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 going to say that later on. So, the castrati. Let's go there. What are the castrati in 1560? The first children are castrated for use in the Sistine Chapel Choir. 1589, Pope Sixtus V issues a papal bull approving the recruitment of castrati by 1625. All sopranos in the Sistine Chapel Choir are castrati. During the 17th and 18th centuries in Italy, some 4,000, 5,000 boys aged between 7 and 9 are castrated annually for the church. Okay, 4,000 to 5,000 boys aged between 7 and 9 are castrated yearly. Woo! 17th, 18th century, that's the 1600s to the 1700s. The slavery was going on. Was there a fascination of the castration larger amongst the Italians than what it was amongst the slaves? Okay? Because there were some big numbers right there. I don't know. Now, what is the castrati, as we have stated in the first bullet point? The castrati is 
the uh, group of boys that were castrated, and there's a lot more. There's a lot more details inside the book on the whole process, on how they did this, the, how many boys survived from the situation, and all of that. And they were a uh, class in the choir to sing, you know, like the soprano and the tenor, and all of that, and the alto. Okay, all of that. And there was a castrate. Now we let's keep it going. Okay. The castrati combined the pure sound of the boy soprano with the lung capacity of the adult male to create a unique sound that has no equivalent in the singing voice of the intact male or the adult female. However, producing a castrato required parents to have their sons forcibly castrated, usually between the ages of six and nine. A boy who survived the crude operation, many died from blood loss or overdosed on the opium or cheap alcohol that was used to sedate them, was then placed in a music school where he would endure a brutal regime of music instruction that would last until he was in the middle of his late teens. Uh, those students who succeeded at their studies were placed in choirs, in churches, cathedrals, and chapels. Failures faced a life of penury and loneliness as there was no place for the castrati outside of a musical setting. I don't know why they wouldn't be used as uh, eunuchs for the harems, but that could be the same, well, who knows, okay? Because that's where the, uh, but we're going to talk about that. that. All that information is going to be coming in the, the eunuchs and the harems will be talked about in the Black Madonna lecture, okay? Now, the castrati had a peculiar in-between status in European society. Uh, and that they were biologically male but weren't uh, considered in the social or psychological sense. Canon law forbade them from getting married, though some did anyway under false pretenses which prevented them from enjoying normal family life. Although most castrati worked in ecclesiastical settings, they were forbidden from becoming priests because their incomplete anatomy disqualified them from being acceptable as in, uh, as in other Christ in the Mass. Castrati were also forbidden from serving in governmental posts or in the military. The effects of prepubescent pre uh, castration caused the castrati to develop unusual physical features, including excessive height, stoutness, unusual long limbs, and hairlessness, particularly as they aged. Some castrati had more feminine features and were subject to accusations that they led honest men into homosexuality with their sexual ambiguity. Now, we have to understand that the cutting of the testicles cut off the, the, the uh, regulation of the testosterone. And the regulation of the testosterone is what measures your height. And that's where you get these oddities. But please understand that these individuals over time have grown into a famous position. Okay? And that could also be where uh, the tall, dark, and handsome may come from as well. But anyways, boys were uh, castrated between the ages of seven and nine years and underwent a long period of voice training. A small number became international opera star stars, of whom the most famous was Farinelli, whose voice ranged over three octaves. By the end of the 18th century, fashions in opera had changed so that the castrati declined except in the Vatican where the Sistine Chapel continued to employ castrati until the 1903. So, if it started in the, in the 1500s, okay, it's 1903, that's 400 year, 350 year, 450 year loop of the mania. What are we embedding in the ether? We are embedding emasculation. Okay, the last of the castrati was Alessandro Marisacci, okay? Uh, who died in 1924 and made gramophone recordings that provide the only direct evidence of a castrato singing voice. Okay. So we have to understand here that the, um, the castrati uh, has a high probability of being of having a lot of origins to what we consider to be fame or famous people today and also like I said earlier the tall dark and handsome okay um, the castration that moved on over into slavery um, the homosexual vibration that's in the church in between the choir boys or the or the uh, the usher boys and the preachers and the 
and those who are teaching or doing the composing for the uh, music inside the church. So we see where all the homosexual energy, as we have a multitude of different cases that is coming out of churches, um, that is directly evidence of what I am stating here, and that the spirit is there, and it was embedded inside the ether throughout this practice that went on for a span of 300 years. 300 to 400 years, okay? So, we have the holy blood and the organ relics, okay? Now, what is the holy blood and the organ relics? The holy blood is uh, blood that has came from different saints. Um, the majority of these cases that I have read were while the saint was dead or through the process of the saint dying. Um, the blood was collected and uh, miracles occur with this blood. Understand that uh, these saints are individuals who died after the so-called Jesus. All right. Now, 300 years later in the year 1608, when it became necessary temporarily to remove the incorrupt body of St. Clair from its shrine, the nuns noticed that the vessel leaked and became and began carefully uh, to wipe it when, despite all her efforts at handling the vial with utmost caution, it nevertheless slipped from her fingers and crashed on the floor. Sobbing bitterly, uh, the distraught nuns picked up every particle of the blood and every shard of glass. All of this was placed in a larger crystal vessel. At some point during the years, a crack in the vessel was noticed, and it was placed in the third vessel. The, the blood and the shards of the glass, together with the second crack of the vessel, and the third uh, crystal covering, are all perfectly transparent. The coagulated blood can be clearly viewed. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. Coagulation. Now, if we remember... The word coagulate right here, okay? There's two different vessels in this thing. Understand that. Vessel right here, vessel right here. Okay. Now, the, uh, the coagula was written on the Baphomet's arms in the movie. Uh, I mean, not, not in, it wasn't written on the... Um, on the Baphomet's arms in the movie, but on the the original drawing, I think it was the drawing comes from the 1800s. It's a Baphomet, and he has solved coagula on his arm. So if you go Google solved coagula, I'm pretty sure it'll show up. And this coagula was also the word in the movie. Um, get out. What is coagula? Coagula is. Uh, congestion on the blood level okay so it is clog as you can spell the word clog in the word coagula okay and this clog is a symbol of past traumas bad eating habits and all this other shit that definitely is in the stage of erectile dysfunction and your sexual life once again is fucked up Okay, so with that being the, with that being the status, you're gonna be the devil. You're gonna be angry because your sex life is shit, and that's the part. That's what it is. Coagula is the congestion, the clog, on the, in the blood. So, and we will talk about the incorrupt saints as they stated her. This this lady Saint Clair provided was incorrupt. We're gonna talk about the incorruption here later on. The mutilated bo body of Saint Josephat remains marvelously incorrupt in the church of St. Sophia in his native Poland when a costly reliquary was crafted of precious metals and engraved with mother of pearl pictures depicting scenes of his martyrdom the body was exhumed for the third time while the incorrupt body of the martyr was being prepared for its enshrinement the mortal wound on the forehead of the saint opened and discharged fresh red blood this amazed the witnesses since St. Josephat had been dead for 27 years. Okay, this is one of the blood miracles. As I stated, the majority of these miracles when it comes to the blood are usually done when the saints are already dead. Okay, uh, the bodies get re-exhumed as you have witnessed here. And usually the, the exhumations are very longer within the time span, usually at a gap of 
300, maybe 200, or sometimes even 400 years, where they have dug up the body and found a new body, and uh, the blood is gushing out of the head, or, there, or the body is emanating sweet scents, and things of that nature. So let's keep it moving. Okay, the stigmata. The stigmata is uh, basically, we just gonna get down to it. The stigmata is uh, the stigmata is definitely a peculiar scenario. Uh, it usually happens to women. There's not so many men that are documented with the stigmata, but let's read this and then I'll give my piece afterwards. Stigmata, singular stigmata, is a term used by members of the Christian faith to describe body mark sores or sensations of pain in locations corresponding to the crucifixion wounds of Jesus Christ, such as the hands, wrists, and feet. An individual bearing the wounds of stigmata is referred to as a stigmatist or a stigmatic. Okay. Um, let me see. The term originates from the line at the end of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians where he says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Stigmata is the plural of the Greek word uh, stigma, meaning a mark, tattoo, or brand such as might have been used or identification of an animal or slave. Stigmata are primarily associated with the Roman Catholic faith. Many reported stigmatics are members of Catholic religious orders. St. Francis of Assisi was the first recorded stigmatic in Christian history. For over 50 years, St. Padre Pio of Pietralencia of the Order of Friars Minor Capuchin reported stigmata which were studied by several 20th century physicians. Your boy St. Francis of Assisi is uh, the saint that is the patron over Naga City in Cebu. Go look it up. Okay? So, and he was the first recorded stigmatic. As the stigma, the stigma means a meaning, uh, a mark or a tattoo, as it says here, my people. What does this mean? A brand such as might have been used for identification of an animal or slave. Are you understanding? Animal and slave are equal. For number one. For number two, a stigmata that is on your body that does not come from the Lord, that does not bear the marks of Jesus, is the way of the devil. Meaning, any tattoo that you have on your body that is not a mark given to you from God, as is stated here, automatically throws you in the status of the devil. As your, our generation, if you're 30 years old or older, uh, our generation has been, you know, doing devil worship just by watching simple cartoons for a very long time. I could, I could go over it. It's a, it would be a lot for me to explain, but it's, well, I could just do it real simple. The Sabbath that we find in volume two, the circle dance, any dancing around in a circle where women are holding hands in a circle or children are holding hands and skipping around in a circle, which is your duck duck goose, which is your musical chairs, which is your, uh, you know, ring around the rosy, all of that is of the devil, my friend. All of that. That is the devil's dance. And you have done it as a child. Now, let's keep it moving. St. Francis of Assisi is the first recorded stigmatic in Christian history in 1224, two years before his death. He embarked on a journey to Mount Laverna for a 40-day fast. One morning near the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, a six-winged angel allegedly appeared to Francis while he prayed. As the angel approached, Francis uh, could see that the angel was crucified. He was humbled by the sight and his heart was filled with elation, joined by pain and suffering when the angel departed. Francis was uh, uh, purportedly left with wounds in his hands, feet, and side as if caused by the same lance that pierced Christ's side. The image of nails immediately appeared in his hands and feet, and the wound in his side often seeped blood. In traditional artistic depictions of the incident, Francis is accompanied by a Franciscan brother. Okay, so as I stated the passions, what do we have here? 
filled with elation, joined by pain and suffering. It is the mixture of the sweet and the sour on the emotional concoction. It's an alchemy of thinking and feeling for the human, okay? Whereas joy and pain mix together at the highest levels, all right? And, it, and you only go through that through uh, hard traumatic experiences. So if you haven't been through any experiences, you haven't traveled, you don't know life, you don't accept the ways of other cultures and understanding, your uh, comprehension of the world is very limited. Okay? As we have here, this is supposedly the angel, the six wing angel as we see. One, two, three. There's two wings right here, three, four wings right here, five, six wings right here. On the cross, St. Francis of Assisi, okay, he is receiving the stigmata, which is the pain. Um, this is another saint right here. Um, I forgot her name. I think she's on the next clip. Okay. But this is the stigmata. So when they tried to make the movie in America about the stigmata, which was humongous, and it had a lot of energy on it, they made it all demonic. Okay? They made it all demonic. You know? They made it very nasty demonic energy. And that was unnecessary. So let's go to the... Okay. Now, crying and with compassion. This is... uh. This is your girl here. Um, this is your girl here. Agnes Banablecken. Okay, she's in the book. This is a painting. Okay, this dude who does who did this painting. I might as well say he does a lot of crazy erotic paintings. So this isn't necessarily a painting of the ancient times. Okay, crying and with compassion, she began to think about the foreskin of Christ, where it may be located after the resurrection. And uh, behold, soon she felt with the greatest sweetness on her tongue, a little piece of skin like the skin in an egg, which she swallowed. After she had swallowed it, she again felt the little skin on her tongue with sweetness as before. And again, she swallowed it. And this happened to her about a hundred times. And when she felt it so frequently, she was tempted to touch it with her finger. Kim was resurrected with the Lord on the day of resurrection. And so great was the sweetness of tasting that little skin that she felt in all her limbs and parts of the limbs, a sweet transformation. Okay, and she is talking about giving Christ She's talking about eating his foreskin after his circumcision. That's what she's talking about. Which is a metaphysic of giving head, but there's not really giving head, I guess. I don't know what's going on here. But what happens is, is there's a lot of story. There's a lot of different uh, documentation about the nuns. It's, it goes very far. A lot of these nuns and a lot of priests, saints, Dominicans, whatever, they all had, you know, their... Personal journals is how a lot of this information is being found. Or their so-called philosophy and ecstasy and their high-level insanity. Where the, this insanity, though, can also be revered as the, uh, the highest form of intelligence, too. So, you can't, really t you can't really tell a person that they're not seeing what they say they may be seeing. Especially if a group of people say that they all see the same thing. You know? So, let's keep it moving. Now... The nuns, ah, uh, the Middle Ages were kind of boring and probably even worse for the sometimes unwilling inhabitants of nunneries. So mewling like cats was uh, one way to pass time. Historical reports indicate that nunneries were rife with motor hysteria. I mean, motor hysteria. Sorry about that. A kind of mass psychogenic illness. Uh, that had some women exhibiting the signs of demonic possession, others acting out in sexually disturbing ways, and one can come in mewling like cats and trying to claw their way up trees. The period of nuns behaving badly lasted around 300 years. Once again, you see it. The 300, 400 years, beginning at around 1400, and affected convents uh, across Europe. One of the last was perhaps the most deadly. In 1749, a woman at a convent in Würzburg, Germany, was beheaded on suspicion of being a witch after an episode of mass fainting, foaming at the mouth and screaming. 
Usually, however, these episodes ended in someone calling in a priest for some uh, exorcisms. Now, there's a, there's a lot of wiring that you could do to a human that can cause this type of crazy ass activity. And you best believe that they were going through the conditions to have this uh, high level traumatic uh, response. You know, I mean, traumatic experiences to develop these type of responses. You know, um, now when it comes to the hundred monkey theory of the, what do they call it here, the psychogenic illness, you know, the, the motor hysteria, or what you want to call um, mass, you know, mass, uh, mass sociology, man, I forgot the word, but it's mass psychology, it's like when you're studying a whole group at one time and a group is operating all on the same um, function, okay, with, with very little verbal litigation, they're all on the same unified thought form, okay, and that's what's going on here. So, uh, and also there's sexual deprivation that's going on. There's a lot of things that are going on because you have to understand that it's not like all these nuns were raised in the, uh, in the monasteries. That's not true in the, in, the nun in, in the nunneries. That's not true. Some of them, you know, because the Catholic structure takes in anybody who gives himself to the Lord or, you know, who gives himself to the ways of the passions, really. It's not even the Lord because they don't worship Jesus directly. They worship uh, the Virgin Mary. So, it is also uh, the Virgin, the Mother Mary in all her phases. So that would be the Virgin Mary, the Mother Mary, and Mary Magdalene. That's all the three different phases. Okay? And, that, and there's also the, the hidden phase of the Venus, the Black Venus, but that's planetary and that's fused into the situation alchemically. So, okay, let's go. Back to where we're going. Now, it is also interesting to know that in the many treaties uh, diffused at that time, Constantine, the African Viaticum, and Pantegni in 1098, but also the Canon of Avicenna, 1025, and Arnaldus of Villa Nova's text, 1240 to 1311, Women were often described as patients to be cured, but rather as the cause of a particular human disease defined as a more hero, uh, hero, heroious or the madness of love, okay? Unfulfilled sexual desire, okay? So basically what's going on here is that these women were supposedly insatiable. And uh, their insatiability is part of the reason, it could be part of the reason uh, Catholicism embedded the the abstinence rule. Okay, I didn't sp speak about the abstinence and why Catholicism embedded it, but I did go. Well, no, I did. I left the sex section in there. The sex section is is long, and I know I had to go over sex in all three volumes. But you have to understand that there's many different pages. There's many different layers to the same situation, and your mind has to be. Uh, you know, there's many different chessboards playing all at once. You know, so the imaginations of women are always more excitable than those of men. And they are therefore susceptible of every folly when they lead a life of strict seclusion and their thoughts are constantly turned inward upon themselves. So that means women need to be reading. Anybody who's not reading is an animal because animals cannot read. Okay? And that's what's going on. Now, um, you need to be taking your information seriously. That is how this thing works. But now events took an odd turn. The original plot having succeeded, no reasons remain for the nuns to feign possession. Okay? Basically what they're talking about is, you know, a lot of these women were being tested on by exorcists and other ecclesiastical officials to see if they were lying or not, just playing a game. When it came to them being possessed. Okay? Yet their symptoms only grew worse. One nun fell to the ground, blaspheming in convulsions, lifting up their petticoats and chemise, displaying her private parts uh, without any shame and uttering filthy words. Her gestures became so indecent that the audience averted its eyes. She cried out again and again, abusing herself with her hands. Come on, then fuck me. <laughs> At other times, the nuns struck their chests and backs with their heads as they... 
as if they had their necks broken and with inconceivable rapidity. Their faces became so frightful one could not bear to look at them. Their eyes remained open without winking. Their tongues issued suddenly from their mouths, horribly swollen, black, hard, and covered with pimples. They threw themselves back till their heads touched their feet and walked in this position with wonderful rapidity and for a long time uh, they uttered cries so horrible and so loud that nothing like it was ever heard before. They made use of expressions so indecent as to shame the most debauched of men. Okay. From pretending to be possessed, from pretending to be possessed, the nuns had in fact come to believe themselves to be possessed. Delusion had bred psychosis. Such events indicate the degree to which the social mania of witchcraft produced insanity in individuals. But the fever was already past its peak in 1687. Louis XIV issued an edict against a sorcery. It was uh, refreshingly immoderate, condemning sorcery. It ignored black cat sex crazed nuns and other lurid fantasies of, witch, of the witch mania. The worst was over. After 1700, the number of witches accused, tried, and condemned fell off rapidly. The decline of the witch craze is as interesting as its rise, but before we lay it to rest, we will want to look at its course in Britain and the American colonies. I did not go over information of anything dealing with the American colonies and witchery and the witchcraft, but it is there. And it is there in large detail for all of early America from Maine, Massachusetts region all the way down to the south of Louisiana. And you best believe it's over here in the southwest as well on the west coast. Okay? And we're talking about during the 1700s and 1800s. How the information disappeared and how people became fucking, how everybody became Bart Simpson is, um, you know, through time and through the wars and killing off the men and killing off the, the information of the old world by generation slaughter of drugs and wars. So, let me see here. Did I just skip one? Okay. Now the penance. You must serve your penance. Everybody must serve the penance. Okay? Everybody must serve the penance. And the reason why you must serve the penance is because you are, you must dedicate to mankind, to existence, to the ether, to the little girls and to the children, to the innocent who will be guilty, to the innocent who have become victims, to the victims who yearn for innocence again. That is what you serve the penance for. The flagellation um, that occurs with the penance, well, the penance is the, the public shaming. The penance is, um, you know, no, re the penance is stopping all pride. There is no pride with the penance. You must Announce your sins in front of your brethren which you, in who you have victimized by making the community full of filth because of your immoral and your heinous activity. And that, uh, a lot of this type of mentality is why they do the white fight and all that type of stuff. It's because if they're going to be guilty for anything, they're going to be guilty for their own. Who know? and who are embedded in their own thinking structure of how the culture operates. Okay? Now, all ceremonies of public penance were aimed at remedying public sins. Public sins, like I said, for mankind. It was seen as the only way to save innocent people from punishment. It is clear that apocalyptic preaching revived the idea of collective responsibility. And even the more moderate preachers, joining St. Thomas on this point, concluded that although each sinner is punished for his or her own transgressions, 
There is nothing to prevent sinners from being struck down by a salutary punishment for someone else's sins and chastised with him if they had tolerated or given consent to the sin. Thus God might punish family, the neighborhood, or the vast of the city, and he might lose the male mort, foul and violent death, for the crimes of the backsliding of a few. This severely limited the consequences that were beginning to be drawn from the theology purgatory. Now let's stop here. Because you see, for those who've been watching the God 720 from the beginning, obviously I must have had a Catholic heart. I didn't know that. But that's just how I operated. You've never seen me unify with these fucking fools out here because these fucking fools don't care about their souls. And you see how they end up. You see how they end up with the embarrassment. You see how they end up filed as a loser. You see, every time you turn on your TV, the same guy that you was worshipping with the fucking Bugatti is a piece of shit paying child support. Okay? He's an animal because the animal cannot make, he does not have the psychological structure to maintain a family union. Amongst the mammals, the majority of the uh, animals do not and will not assist the mother with the child. Therefore, you are animal if you have committed and created the same scenario for yourself. That is how it operates. And that is ethereal law. Because animals are supposed to operate one way, and humans are supposed to operate another way. And it's all psychological. Just like they said animals or slaves had tattoos. Because animals, by nature, have patterns on their skin or their fur. Do they not? Yes, they do. Thank you. So we see what we have here. There's a game being played, and you are Boo Boo the Fool if you want to fuck around with it. Okay? The anathema being anathemized. Okay? What you see here is a torture device. This is a torture device. The, rose, the original a rosary beads, which has been passed on to the Roman, I mean, to the uh, Mexicans through Catholicism. But the original energy that is embedded on this is a penance and embarrassment. Okay? Now, the, now this has nothing to do with being anathemized. This is a pillory punishment, a church pillory punishment. Usually, this rosary bead would be thrown around the neck and you would have to wear this in front of the church. Or during, while, while sermon is given if you were to be falling asleep in the pew. Okay? So, now, being anathemized. Bartholomew Chastening, 1480 to 1541, mentioned several instances of the effectiveness of anathemas. Okay? Accepting as convincing testimony the ecstasies of saints and the extravagant statements of hagiologists without the slightest expression of doubt as to the truth of these legends. Thus he relates how a priest anathem uh, anathematized an orchard because its fruits tempted the children of his parish and kept them away from the mass. The orchard remained barren until at the, solic the solicitation of the Duchess of Burgundy the ban was removed. In like manner the Bishop of Lausanne freed Lake Lemaine from eels, which has become so numerous as Siri and bathing. On another occasion in the year 1451, the same ecclesiastic expelled from the waters of this lake an immense number of enormous blood suckers, which threatened to destroy all the large fish. So, the anathemas are excommunication. But usually they're done towards the Diodans. And the Diodans, as we've seen in volume one, would be like a tree or, you know, the animals. Uh, you know, too many locusts, they would do the anathema. So you anathemize them, you know, and you do the sign of the cross. And you ask the Lord and they will be removed. They had so much power, they were so holy. And that's how these individuals became saints, as we were talking about in the beginning. They had to live a lot of holiness, okay? And they were so holy that they committed all of these miracles, supposedly. Now, the state of ecstasy, 
which we're about to go into right here. The State of Ecstasy. Thomas Merton tells us in his biography of St. Lutgard of Ariers that the saint became so fervent in choir that a flame was soon to, seen to shoot out of her mouth and rise into the air. A young nun who happened to look up just in time to catch the sight of the strange phenomenon was so panic stricken that she fell over in a dead faint. Okay? So to fall over and die from something that you've seen that was so outrageous is definitely embedded in European stories. Okay? So we also have another situation here where this woman supposedly um, shot flame out of her mouth. Okay, well, I don't know. If, uh, yeah, shot flame out of her mouth. And uh, that was the power she had because she was inflamed with the word of God. Okay? Let me see here. Let me show you. Another incident in the life of St. Francis of Assisi involved a little rabbit that had been caught in a trap and was brought to him by one of the brothers. When the saint saw the rabbit, he said to it, Brother rabbit, come to me. Why did you allow yourself to be caught like this? As soon as the brother uh, placed the rabbit on the ground, thinking that it would hop towards the woods, but it jumped again into his lap, an action that was repeated a number of times until the saint directed the brother to carry the rabbit into the woods. Now this situation makes St. Francis of Assisi over the, uh, I do believe he is patron over, let's see what he is patron of real quick. Okay. I do believe he is the, yeah, he is the patron saint over animals, the environment, Italy, merchants, stowaways, the Cub Scouts, San Francisco, California. As you see, the name San Francisco. Francisco is named after him. His feast day is October 4th. <coughs> so that's how the situation is operating. And he is, he is venerated in uh, four of the different forms of the Catholic Church. Because there are many. So, St. Francisco, St. Francis, there you go. Okay, it's that simple. California is definitely the Catholic state of uh, the West Coast. And to go alchemically, St. Paul, Minnesota is probably the Catholic state of the North. Uh, New Orleans would definitely be, uh, Louisiana would be the Catholic state of the South. And I don't know what the Catholic state of the East Coast would be. Uh, I would have to get real detailed on that because there's a lot of stuff up in there. So, um, regardless, let's go. Let's keep going. So, St. Ferreldis, a Belgian laywoman, is said to have used her distaff to strike the side of a hill near Brue, uh, near Valentines, causing a fountain of fresh water to spring out of the ground to relieve the thirst of the harvesters who were reaping for her. The fountain is believed to have contained healing virtues, especially for children's complaints, and so the saint is invoked by mothers who are anxious about the health of their little ones. Okay. So here's another miracle. We can split the, we can tap the water out of the rock, supposedly, which this story is in repetition. And you have to understand that a lot of these uh, miracle stories are in repetition throughout all of the saints. They're similar, or they have comparisons that uh, both can be related on a bottom line principle on the point of the story. And the reason why it's done like that is divide these stories up amongst the planet to develop the proper thinking structures that are, that are needed for whatever ranks they need for controlling of specific regions. Okay. Because the Catholic system is worldwide. The Catholic system is embedded in every uh, religion or unified with every religion. There are, there are Muslims who uh, are also uh, involved heavily with the Catholic structure that is that is there, okay? 
Fives are also mentioned in the life of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Um, and you have, to, you have to also watch what's going on here. This is alchemy right here. Since they visited the saint while he was in Fogni uh, for the dedication of a monastery church, during the service, the church was filled with a multitude of flies that disturbed the devotion of the uh, faithful with their buzzing. Since no one knew how to disperse them, St. Bernard cried out, uh, Excommunicabo es. I shall communic excommunicate them. As I said, excommunication and the is the same thing. The next day, the flies were all found dead. Their number was so great that they blackened the pavement and were removed from the church with shovels. A chronicler of the time adds this miracle was so well known and so celebrated that the curse of the flies of Fogney passed into a proverb among the people around who had come from all parts to assist at the dedication of the church. Okay, so what's going on right here is the flies. Flies blacking the room and clairvoyance. The clairvoyant, which is also on the occultic side, is called clairvoyance, is to be able to see um, clearly into the future, or you know, be able to soothsay, and to be able to fortune tell. And you have to have clairvoyance to do that. So he's this story is expressing the power of clairvoyance without doing it in a devilish format of characters like soothsayers and witches and whatnot. This was done by their internal power being linked in with the so-called greater power which is supposed to be the holiness not necessarily a god but the holiness okay so let's go okay the levitation and the bilocation levitation and bilocation St. Francis of Assisi was often suspended above the earth, sometimes to a height of three, sometimes to a height of four cubits. The same phenomenon has been recorded by eyewitnesses in many instances throughout the centuries. Among the large number of those who are known to have been raised from the ground, whilst wrapped in prayer, are the stigmatized St. Catherine of Siena, St. Colette, uh, Renario do Bargo, uh, St. Sepulchro, uh, St. Catherine of De Ricci, St. Alphonsus uh, Rodriguez, St. Mary Magdalene de Pisi, uh, Raymond de Rocco, uh, Bishop Charles de Sayes, and St. Veronica Giolani, the Capuchinus, St. Gerard Mahela, okay, the Redemptorist, uh, Thaumaturge, that wondrous mystic and Catherine Emmerich, Dominica Barbagli died in 1858. The ecstatica of Montesanto Savino, Florence, whose levitations were of daily occurrence. St. Ignatius Lo, uh, Loyola um, <laughs> wills the deeply contemplative was seen by John Paschal to be raised more than a foot from the pavement. St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross were levitated in concurrent ecstasies in the shady uh, locutorio. Uh, that's the loc locomotive. Locutorio is locomotive. And the locomotive is a whole nother level of uh, information. But anyways, of the incarnation as was witnessed by uh, Beatrice of, G of Jesus and the whole coming of nuns. St. Alphonsus Ligary, whilst uh, preaching in the church of St. John the Baptist at Foggia, was lifted before the uh, eyes of the holy congregation several feet from the ground. St. Alphonsus, Alphonsus Ligary, um, his feast day is on my birthday. He is the saint that is over the congregation of the Holy Most Redeemer. Okay? Um, right. Let's keep it moving. Before St. Drago uh, in 1186 was born, his father died, and at his birth, his mother also died, leaving him an orphan. When he was old enough to understand, he learned that his mother's life had been sacrificed for his own, a revelation that distressed him greatly. Around the age of 18, he decided to follow our Lord in strict poverty and embarked on a penitential life as a pilgrim, visiting churches and shrines 
in uh, several lands. Okay, now, a penitential life as a pilgrim means that he was a bum, he was walking around with rags, he was stink, and he was begging, okay? And he was begging in the stage of mercy. He was begging with sympathy. He was begging with passion. He was doing it for the Lord and not committing any crime. He was giving his soul for mankind. That's basically what these individuals are doing. And the stories get far more drastic and far more outlandish the deeper you go into history, especially when you run into what a lot of the saints did when they took on penitential lives in the course of Rome, which this is all medieval activity. Understand there is a divide and there is a difference. Okay, now, after a time, he settled at Sabor near Valenians, uh, where he was hired as a shepherd by Elizabeth de la Hare. In this humble position, he grew even deeper in prayer and virtue and was regarded as a saint by the people of the district. It is known that he tended the sheep every day, yet he was often seen assisting at the offering of the holy sacrifice in distant churches. So many of these by locations were noted that a local saying became widely known, not being St. Drago, I cannot be in uh, two places at the same time. So that's what by location is, which is an element I've never heard. That's not even, I didn't hear about that within any areas of the occult or any tribal studies I've done. I've never heard of a bilocation being in two areas at one time. So this right here is maybe a jump or a leap to say the uh, to state the superiority over what the dark side uh, does uh, represent and what their capabilities are. Okay, to be one with the Lord and to be one in the stage of holiness and not to want for anything. Okay, basically to be a eunuch. Uh, you will be filled with so much um, you will be filled with so much holiness that you can bilocate, you can float and do a lot of other things. So Margarito Castello, also called Margaret de Mitola, after her birthplace, was born in twelve eighty seven in the castle of the of the nobleman Periceo and his wife Emilia at Mitola. Uh, but her father was not really noble. When his wife was with child, Pericio simply assumed that he would have a healthy son and heir. But the festivities planned to celebrate this joyful event were suddenly called off when the child born was a dreadfully deformed girl. She was unusually small, hunchbacked, facially deformed, her right leg was shorter than the left, and she was blind. Margaret's parents treated her very badly. They kept the child hidden from relatives and friends and worse from themselves. When she was six years old, her father walled her up in a cell next to a chapel hidden in a forest. Fourteen years later, her parents took to a shrine at Cita de Castello to pray for a cure. When she was not cured, Margaret's parents returned home without a word to their blind, crippled daughter, cruelly abandoning her. Left to roam the streets, Margaret became a beggar among beggars she had always been a bright, good child and had profited from lessons of the castle's chaplain. Left on her own at age 20, she became a holy young woman, blind but limping around to help others. Okay? Which means that, um, as you can see, as I stated, the passions. A lot of these people that are so-called saints come from stories. These stories are uh, where they were shunned, they were abandoned, sort of like what we were taught in a Cinderella or a Snow White type of scenario. To feel sympathetic and to give emotion, to give feeling, to feel from, to not want to be, to relate, to find similarity, okay? That is what's going on here. It is the invisible elements being controlled and it is the invisible elements of communication in between the human, the stories that make us feel, okay? There's tons of them in, in, in the Catholic system that bring you to a hold on the emotional structure uh, over human existence because they've compiled all the possibilities of uh, human existence and that would be in the imaginative format and also in the literal format, okay? 
and that's including folklore animals and they even have folk saints but we don't we're not going over any folk saints but i will mention a folk saint since i brought it up a folk saint would be uh saint christopher who is a dog-headed saint and uh, another folk saint would be uh saint morte saint mort Morte. You got to do your R's right. The R's are ridiculous. See, uh, see, in all other languages across the globe, they got to, they roll the R's, and we're not used to that. Okay, we're used to the R, R. -a. Yeah, I know when I know y'all got them, them old schoolers in your family say R, -a, nigga. <laughs> Anyways, so back to the saints. That's what's going on here. Okay, so Saint Morte. M-U-E-R-T-E is a skeleton, female skeleton saint of uh, southern Mexico region. A lot of gangsters take hold to it. Matter of fact, whole cities take hold to it out there. But uh, one reason the Mexican people are the second layer of the Catholic structure is because they understand hell enough to have their own devil. And they have their own devil, and that is Diablo. Okay? Um, that is what has happened. The Spain, the, the Spain is the doorway in between Europe and Africa. You have to understand this. Okay? So... When a European says Spaniard, they're saying half nigga. Automatically. Automatically. There's no getting around that. Okay? So, over time, due to this uniqueness of who the Spanish people were, and also being right on top of the Alexandria, and also being right there at the Mesopotamia, being able to control, and being, connect, being closer to the Ethiopia link, they have their respect and they were able to develop their own and expand their own system which uh, went to the Mexicans and now it's called Roman Catholicism okay that's what was given to them underneath that cloak so uh, this yeah on the day she became a Mantaletta a member of the third order of penance of Saint Dominic, the blind Margaret knew about a dozen psalms by heart. The next morning she knew all 100 of the psalms by heart. She said the knowledge simply came to her. Despite her deformities, Margaret had always been kind and cheerful. She once made a profound impression on a group of prisoners when she was elevated some 20 inches off the ground in an ecstatic prayer and her poor face was transformed in beauty. She made true predictions about what would happen to various individuals. She cured a little girl who was dying and ended a roaring fire in the home where she lived by throwing her cloak down the stairs upon the flames. Margaret is also credited with having restored to life a man and two children. A little boy fell into a river and was drowned. When his body was recovered, the heartbroken mother prayed to Margaret and the child came back to life. Just by praying to her, the saint, she's so holy. Okay, this is the blessed Margaret of Matola, who died in 1320 and was found incorrupt in two, I mean, in 1558, which is a 230 year gap. Um, her body is on display under the high altar of the church of Saint D Domenico, Domenico at Cita de Castello in Italy. Okay, so some of these incorrupt bodies are wax shapes of them. And some of them are real. So who knows? Um, but this is what's going on. Alright? Okay. So this is the incorruptible. Now raising the dead. This is this is the interesting part. St. Martin de Porles, as I stated earlier, 1579 to 1639, a mulatto who lived nearly twice as long as his friend Rose. Brought black, brought black and white together then and has done so ever since. When he died, as when Rose passed away, the whole city of Lima and the most important people turned out. There were many wonders in Martin's life of charity. The multiplication of food, cures, ecstasies, by locations, etc. Though he was a Dominican, he had a Franciscan love for animals 
and was so kind to them as even to warn rodents to leave the monastery when their destruction was being planned. Okay, so you must understand that we show a love for life with the St. Martin de Perez. So you having a problem on your job with white folk. You're a black man. You put this saint on your desk, the problems will ease. It's really that simple. And the reason why is because all the energy is embodied for this principle in this saint. So just go ahead and use it because your ravaging anger is not going to heal the situation. Martin brought back to life a dead dog, a longtime pet of the Dominican monastery in Lima. The dog had grown quite old, 18 years old, and had become mangy and smelly to boot. The animal was a pet on an older monk of the community. Brother John, who felt it is his duty to destroy the dog, he ordered a negro to do so. The negro killed it with a blow from a stone that fractured its skull. The man was dragging off the dead dog to dispose of it when he ran into Brother Martin. Martin reproved him severely, then carried the dog in his arms to his cell and laid it on the floor. As soon as the dog touched the floor, it began to move and pulled itself to a sitting position. Then Martin washed the blood in the dirt of the wound uh, and stitched the head together. The dirt was cured of both the head wound and the mange. The old monk was very pleased to have his pet back. Martin humbly reproved him stating that he had not done well in ordering a companion of so many years to be killed. This story was attested by three witnesses and presented during St. Martin's canonization process. Okay, so as we see during the canonization we go through a long resume of what you have done during the course of your life in the guise of holiness to see if you fit as a saint. Okay, now in the 14th century, there was a miracle involving Bishop Peter Armingall, 1238-1304, a converted robber captain. In his new life of charitable zeal, at one time he was attempting to arrange a ransom deal for 18 Christians held hostage while waiting for the ransom uh, money to arrive. Predator, in the newfound enthusiasm of his conversion, preached Christ to the Moors. Okay? During this time, there was a lot of activity going on with the Moors. Um, the Moors did not respond favorably to Peter's efforts. They hanged him. He had uh, hanging there for six days. He had been hanging there for six days when his friend Florentine arrived with the ransom money. Florentine, in great shock and grief, was amazed to hear the body speak to him, saying that he, Peter, was alive through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the, in the presence of many witnesses, Florentine cut Peter down alive and well. Now, um, after this scenario, uh, Peter Armingall created the Order of the Ransom of Mary. Okay, the, or, the, the Order of the Ransom. And then later on, that same Order of the Ransom became... Uh, the Order of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mercy. Okay. Her unsuspecting husband, Marcin, walked in on his dreadful sight. When he saw his wife in that condition between the two corpses of his sons, he did not pause to think, but in great emotion and apparently thinking she had uh, killed them both, he grabbed a nearby axe and crushed her skull with one blow. Okay. After a little while, Marcin's mind cleared. He realized what he had done, and dreadful fear and remorse seized him. In the meantime, neighbors and friends were gathering with mixed emotions, and some with pious advice. Uh, Marcin uh, seemed to have a heavenly inspiration, and he turned from despair to hope in Our Lady of Sisdoschwa. Uh, Sist Sist I don't even know how to say the word. Sisdesht Ochoa, to whom... He had always been devoted. Our Lady of Poland is what I'm going to say. is because that city is located in Poland. Sejestrowa. Okay? Sejestrowa is located in Poland. Okay? Now, this story is coming from... I don't know what happened to the front part. It must have got... Let me see here. Yeah. Okay, now... The story must have been too long, so let me brief you on what is happening here. A woman was baking bread. Um, 
she put the things in the so she went out to uh, get some wheat to get the ingredients together to bake bread. And when she went out, her four-year-old son, seeing the butchers and watching the butcher men slaughter pigs in the, in the farm, went to his infant brother and decided to do the same. So he slit his little brother's neck, and when the mother came inside the house and went to, she started up the stove, she started up the fire, and um, she went to the kitchen to start the ingredients for the bread. And when the little boy noticed what he did with all the blood everywhere, it struck him. He went to the stove and hid inside the stove. So then, when uh, she heard a scream from the stove, it was her son screaming from the smoke and the heat and was dying. Okay? And she ran to the baby and when she ran to the first son, she saw the other son with the, with the throat slit. And then that's when the father came inside the house and saw her sitting there with the two corpses of his sons. And he and, and she was screaming and frantically and he thought she had went mad. So then he came down, he went upside her head, okay, and killed her. But now all the neighbors had arrived, standing in shock and amazement at the tri tragedy. Their astonishment grew as Marcy then silently and determinedly loaded the three corpses onto a wagon, made the sign of the cross, and turned the horses toward Hasnagora. Some watched in fear, others in tears. Marcin journeyed on silently toward uh, Jasnagora with people assembling along the roadside as they saw or heard of the strange sight of a man with three dead persons, apparently his own wife and sons in an open wagon. As Marcin came to the shrine, several kinds of persons improvised three caskets and carried them into the chapel. Marcin remained at the door prostrate, uh, pleading with the entering faithful to pray to the Madonna for his family. Perhaps he felt too guilty to go inside. Inside the shrine, the Blessed Stanislaw Oporowski, a devout priest, was conducting benediction of the most blessed sacrament. The portrait of the Black Madonna high above the main altar seemed to glow with heavenly splendor. Blessed Stanislaw and all the congregation joined in supplications for the poor husband and his family. The three dead persons laid out before all the mother and two little Boys were a piteous, uh, uh, piteous sight. All the congregation sang the Blessed Mother's Hymn, the Magnificat. A supernatural feeling uh, penetrated the chapel at the words, because he that is might hath done great things to me, and holy is his name. A shock came over the congregation. The three lifeless corpses came to life and slowly rose from their places. For a moment there was a seemingly age-long silence, then came a spontaneous outburst and all joined in a thanksgiving hymn to the Madonna. Husband, wife, and children had a marvelous reunion. So, this story is showing you a little stuff about the Black Madonna that we will be going over in the Black Madonna DVD. The Black Madonna stands over infants and she stands over babies, she stands over uh, difficult pregnancies, and she's also stands over dead babies, okay, and revives them. Sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't. Okay? Now, the incorruptible saints. There are many of them. They're scattered all across the planet. So, let's talk about it. 152 years after the death of St. Rita of Cassia, in 1457, her body was found incorrupt. 22 years after the beautifully preserved body was found, the eyes of the saint opened and remained so for many years as paintings executed during the time indicate. Not only was the prodigy noted, but also observed by many were the movements of the body. From time to time, the body would turn and remain for some years on one side and then turn to the other side. The nuns of the coming uh, gave testimony under oath of the fact that these movements of the body did indeed take place. Another phenomenon, the elevation of the body, was such that the saints face would touch the screen of wire that formerly enclosed the top of the old coffin. This is said to have happened each year on St. Rita's feast day, the 22nd of May. Okay. So, 
Let's see here. Here is the incorruptible Saint Rita of Cassia is right here. And Saint Zeta right here. One of my incarnations. Okay? And why do I say that? Because um the Onyx tab, the album that I put out, was uh, produced on April 27th. When I did the Onyx tablet, that was right around real nigga etiquette time. I knew nothing about Catholicism, okay? Um, after that time period, uh, I went and did, you know, all three volumes. And then just recently, as I was building my websites and doing a lot of work, I ran across the April 27th date on the Onyx tablet. So I went and looked up the the date and see whose feast day it was, and it ended up being Saint Zeta. Saint Zeta is uh, the patron over maids and servants, female servants. Okay, so that is the Onyx tablet energy, servitude, my patient, baby girl. Okay, and then not only that, the Onyx tablet. I have also come to find out was uh, is the book of Seth. The book of Set of uh, Egypt, okay, which is basically, you know, would be a dark side book if you understand who Set is. Now, let's keep it moving. Saint Zita, Virgin and Miracle Worker, okay, the patron of servants, homemakers, lost keys, people ridiculed for their piety, rape victims. Y'all know I don't be liking about you. See how that energy works right there? You see it? Y'all know I don't be liking all that rape shit and all that bullshit. I've been talking about. Single lay women, the waiters, the waitresses, canonized in 1696. Her body is incorrupt. San Fridiano is the resting place of the remains of St. Zita, one of Italy's incorruptible bodies. Okay? As we've seen St. Zita in the last picture. St. Zita's in the book. Okay? Now, we go to the next one. This guy right here was, uh, let me see here. Okay, this is uh, St. Francis of Assisi, I think, right there. Okay, but let's go to the next one. This is the incorrupt body of St. Teresa Margaret. I'm just showing y'all. Now, one thing about the magic and the metaphysics of these incorrupt bodies will be saying to the mummification of the uh, pharaohs of Egypt and many other high-ranking individuals of ancient Egypt. When we understand the 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 levels of intelligence that must be embedded inside of a cultural structure in order for a civilization to to exist this would definitely be those higher levels of intelligence the catholic structure for our modern day western world which what i'm saying is, is that what the and the system of higher level intelligence for ancient egypt is the same system for the higher level of intelligence of America today, except for it is embedded in Catholicism, and it is different, and it is a far more vast to my current intelligence. From what I do know, Egypt is based upon the understanding and the detailing of the purgatory status, okay, which is the status in between life and existence, and to be prepared for death by living in a holy condition, which that is the basis of what's going on in Catholicism, which is also trying to bring evidence or trying to bring proof to the fact that uh, being so holy, God won't even want your flesh to rot. Therefore, we will never have vermin running around in the body of the holy. Therefore, you will be, you, you do not mold, you do not bring stench, okay? And this could be a possibility of the human existence, which also is uh, definitely embedding in the brain to have common courtesy, okay? This is St. Teresa Margaret, okay? Here we go. This is another one. Uh, the Virgin uh, uh, Centurion was born on April 2nd, 1587 in Genoa and was of noble origin. She was the daughter of Giorgio Centurion, okay? And Lelia Spinola. Despite her desire to live a cloistered life, she was forced into a marriage to Gaspar Grimaldi Bercelli, who was a rich noble on, 10, on the 10th of December. She had two daughters. The marriage did not last long, for she became a widow on the June 13th at the age of 20. She refused another arranged marriage, 
brought on due to her father's influence and took up a vow to live a chaste life. Okay? So, she lived a chaste life. And that's what happened to a lot of these women. And the marriages are documented as being very happy in the Catholic realm. I will say that. So, here he is. That's kicked out of heaven by the three. That's the Saints <clears throat> DVD. Um, we got the, the next ones is coming up. So, y'all get at me. All right. The guys of attorney.com. Um, Keenan Book. What's the skinny jean wearing nigga with purple dreads? Got a divorce bald bitch that give him dry hair. What about her best friend? Looks like her baby daddy on the gender bin. Trying to put the little homies on a homo trend? Fuck what they say. His boss, little Wayne, lovey daddy won't let him play. Tired of chicken dumplings steady coming from the AU niggas. Be from small towns and the neighboring states. So please let me present the facts on the case. Your honor, they're all cowards. You can see it on their face. If they make a wrong move, the dude will put them in their place. So I want you young and little niggas. Grab your ankles. Why you on the chase for the Got no person, they hurtin' inside. They daddy wasn't there and they mama told him lies. Which he sent, got the muscles, but the bitches got his pride. Rick Ross on decline, his outfit to disguise. Snoop got locked up, cause Whitey thought he was high. Shook Knight got hit with a bell at million twenty-five. These supposed to be our bad guys. At the same time, every nigga in the country about to get shot up. And ain't a billionaire nigga that done drop one buck. What about Farrakhan and the Million Man March? Every time niggas gather, they gotta bring grocery carts. I'll let you miss from dance in the king's court with no heart for the motherfucking... Hey! Niggas speak and think on a third grade level They complain about signing contracts with the devil Even Puffy got in trouble and had to be humble Too much gas in that Lambo, get your hair bubbled UCLA got money from slave days What about Dr. Dre, who almost lost a big deal Cause a homie got on Instagram flashing champagne and bills Meek Mill, apologizing to Chief Real. While West Coast of Texas, give a fuck how you feel Jay-Z, know the deal, be a father for real Hip-hop is dead, the bitch just lost the repeal Now tell me how many more niggas Get killed for the hey,